All right, our, our last talk for this session in, um, is by Professor Perguner Martinson, um, who's at University of Texas at Austin, and he holds the W.A. Moncrief Jr. Chair, uh, in, and he serves as a professor of mathematics. Um, he has many awards to his name. I'll mention a couple of them. He's won the 2017 Siam uh, Dahlquist Prize and the NSF Career Award. Uh, his re research in interests span a wide variety of topics, but uh, the ones that I'm most familiar with are fast track solvers for PDE and boundary integral equations. And of course, his topic for today, which is randomized algorithms for large scale linear algebra problems. Uh, on a personal note, uh, his Petros mentioned his review paper, and that's the review paper that I give all my students. So it's like a rite of passage. So it's wonderful to have you speak uh, on, on randomized algorithms for computing full and partial factorization of matrices. Uh, Kanar, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Arvin. That was a very kind introduction. And many thanks for setting this up. This is a wonderful workshop. I'm looking forward to it. And, uh, and thanks to Petros. That was a wonderful introduction to the field. And, uh, provided a, a really excellent high level view that I'm not going to attempt to do. So what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is a little bit more sort of the nitty gritty of how these things work. So I'm going to describe some randomized algorithms for factorizing matrices. So mostly focused on the low rank approximation case where the matrix has approximate rank and you want to compute an approximate factorization to it. Briefly talk about how you can extend these to full factorizations, but uh, the vast majority is, is just about how to do low rank approximation to matrices. And let me stress right away that I posted the slides on my webpage already. So if somebody wants to download them and follow along, then you might find that helpful. All right, so the problem I'll start with and will stick to for a large part of the talk, it, it's really a, a very classic and basic problem. So you're given a matrix A and uh, it can be rectangular. It doesn't have to be symmetric, obviously, and so on. The only criteria, the only condition on A here is that it should make sense to do a low rank approximation to it. So its singular values have to decay to some degree. And if that's the case, then I want to compute a factorization, a approximate singular value decomposition of the matrix. And for a while, I'm going to make the assumption that it's substantially low rank, so that the rank is substantially smaller than the matrix dimensions. And in some of the applications, we'll think about A as being gigantic, which is mostly what uh, Petros talked about. But uh, this, these techniques can also be powerful when A is perfectly moderate size, when M and N are hundreds or thousands or something like this, which might be a little bit surprising, but we'll see how that works. And the general outline, the sort of template of the algorithm is exactly how Petros described it. We'll start with randomized sketching to develop. So we used randomization to develop some sort of some smaller piece of information that captures the essential information about A that we need. So in these algorithms that I'm gonna describe, it's often the case that what we want is, we want to determine a subspace that approximately captures the range of A. So some linear subspace wherein most of the columns of A align to high precision. Once you have that, then you project A down to that subspace, and then you perform sort of traditional, well-established, deterministic techniques to compute the actual factorization. And the way this works, it's the basic algorithm is really extraordinarily simple. You have MATLAB code here on the right. Oh, like here. So you could just code this up and test it for yourself, see how it works. But uh, so the way it works is you start with your matrix A, which is large, think of it say, and then you take, you draw a random matrix omega that's thin. So A will look like this, and then you take your omega and you multiply them together, and then you get the sketch. So the sketch is this matrix Y, and the point is that it's small. It's much smaller than the matrix A. Um, so the random matrix, I don't remember if I said, so it, it's a, what we call a Gaussian random matrix. So every entry is drawn independently from a standard normal distribution. So you compute your sketch Y, and uh, this captures, we claim, the range of A to some degree of accuracy. So then uh, where the numerics section comes in, tr traditional numerical analysis here, next we orthonormalize the columns of Y 
to get this uh, matrix Q. And then once you have Q, then you're basically done. That's where the randomization comes in. Because once you have Q, so what we're looking for is the factorization like this. And that really is your low rank factorization because Q is now a tall thin matrix and Q star times A is a matrix of the, that's just flipped over, tall thin matrix that's flipped over. So in stage A, you compute your low rank approximation. And then in stage B, all you're doing is that you're doing rotations in the small dimension to convert this factorization Q times Q star A into this approximate singular value decomposition U D V star. So uh, point being that stage B is exact. You don't introduce any additional error in stage B. So in order to analyze the errors, what matters is really how well this approximation holds. So we'll talk about that a little bit about what these errors look like, when they're good, when they're not, what can you do about it and so on. But before we do, let's spend a little bit more time going over the intuition here. And I, I'm sure I'm boring the people in the working group at this point, but I wanted to make sure that uh, we all can follow the talk. Um, so how does this work? So let's start with the easiest case. So the special case is when A has rank exactly K. So in that case, what are we doing? So each column of Y is a random linear combination of the columns of A. So of course, obviously it lies inside the range of A, it lies inside the column space and all these samples. So each column of Y, it's an independent sample from that linear space. And you can prove very easily that with probability one, they will be linear independent. So you have K linear independent vectors in a K dimensional subspace. So of course they form a basis. So once you ortho orthogonalize them, you're done that in that case, A will be, so in this particular case, you will have with probability one, that this equality holds. And at that point, it's really just a matter of doing some small rotations in the small dimensions, and you get the exact singular value decomposition. Right, so, but that's, that's the sort of baby case. In reality, we of course typically have a situation where the singular values of A tend to decay rather than just go down to zero at some point. And in particular in data applications, you always have noise, you might use spectral methods for some problem from data science. In that case, you typically have some large singular values that are outliers, those are the ones you want, and they have a bunch of small ones. And the difficulty is really to filter out the large components. And this is where you're gonna to have to pay a price for doing randomized sampling because those components that you don't want. So the, the idea here in the case where you don't have exact rank, what you want is for the columns of Q to span the same space as the dominant K left singular vectors of A. But that's not what you're gonna get in the general case because you're gonna get pollution from the smaller singular vectors, the ones you don't want. But there's an easy fix for that. So what you do is that you, uh, you oversample a bit, so you draw more samples. So in stage A, don't pull just K samples. Instead, you draw some extra. And the magic here, which makes things, what makes these methods so powerful is that you don't need to do a lot of extra oversampling. In many cases, drawing just five or 10 extra vectors, where the number five or 10 really is independent of the matrix size, is oftentimes enough. Um, so if you do that, now you're going to get a subspace. So your sketching is now gonna be off in one direction. You're gonna pull in too much. You go, you're sketching too generously. But this is perfectly fine because in the second stage, you can filter out the components. So when you compute the exact SVD of your projected matrix, you then filter out the stuff that came in by accident. So this very well illustrates what Petra said that you know sketching is all, good and well, but you have to do it right. That, uh, you know, if you say, so this is very different from say Monte Carlo method, where if you either go above or below, so you wanna to try to estimate the, the volume of some complicated shape in a high dimensional box or something, one of these classical Monte Carlo problems, in that case, you, you're in trouble in either direction that you missample, which also means that you need to have very high quality 
random numbers. Your pseudo random number generator has to be very good. That's not really the case here, which is also why, as Petros talked about, we have a lot of flexibility in choosing this random matrix. Gaussian is in some sense ideal, it's very practical, but there are lots of other choices that can sometimes work even better. All right, so here I summarized the basic algorithm. So I'm going to just make some general points about how this works in practice. So um, first of all, let's talk about how does this compare to classical methods? So if you were given this problem and you look it up, you check your notes from your linear algebra course, how am I supposed to solve this? You'll find probably the first idea that you'll see is, uh, is to perform Gram-Schmidt on the columns, right? This is the standard way of how to produce an orthonormal basis for a set of vectors. And that works very well. That corresponds to doing column pivoted QR on A. And the cost in this case would be MNK, because if the matrix is rank deficient, at some point you can stop. Um, so when the projection is away, you, you'll find when you do Gram-Schmidt that at some point there's not very much left. So you only need to take k steps. So the cost is m and k. Another thing you could do is you could run a classical Krylov method. And if the matrix is dense, then again, the cost would be m and k. And uh, the, mate, the method I showed you, this randomized SVD has the same cost because this step is the matrix matrix multiply and this step is the matrix matrix multiply and they both cost m and k so at this point we haven't really done any fundamental gain over the classical methods what we have gained for the case of a dense matrix is that we've cast all the flops into the matrix matrix multiply which is very fast it's, it's something that executes particularly efficiently on modern hardware because it's communication constrained it's not the flops turn out to not really be the critical points anymore. It's really how you move information between memory. And as Petros mentioned, sometimes your matrix may be stored in, in, uh, on a hard drive, or it might be a gigantic matrix that's stored on a distributed system and so on. And you, in those cases, doing a matrix matrix multiply is much faster than doing a number of consecutive matrix vector operations. And we'll talk later about how by choosing a different omega, you can accelerate this even further. And in much of the talk, I'm going to frame things as if the rank is given in advance. That's typically not the case in practice. So you can with slight modifications, you can just modify the algorithms a little bit so that you can handle the much more realistic situation where you're given a tolerance and it's part of your task to determine the rank. For yourself. So the basic scheme that I've described, it's, uh, we'll talk about the errors, but I'll start with the punchline. So basically, the case is that when uh, the singular values decay rapidly, then this basic randomized SVD will work very well. When they decay slowly, it works not so well. And in that case, you will need to incorporate a little bit of uh, powering. So you run the algorithms on a power of A instead. So it sort of moves a little bit more towards traditional subspace iteration or Krylov methods. Let's look at some numerical examples. So what I'm showing here is a matrix to singular values decay very rapidly. So this is a discretized scattering matrix. So you have a, some wave that comes in and hits an object and it's scattered out. And in this case, there's some finite amounts of information which cor corresponds to the size really of the object in uh, oh, my pen stopped working uh, so my apple pen is acting up ah there it goes all right so we have some finite amount of information here that really in this case corresponds to the size of the object once you go beyond that, the singular values start decaying very rapidly. So the black line shows the, the singular values to this operator or this matrix. And the red line are the errors you get from the randomized SVD. And you see that they, they do really very well. So say you wanted five digits of accuracy, then you know maybe the exact rank is 45. And if you ran the randomized method, you would need 48 samples before you hit that accuracy. And if you do a little bit of powering, if you apply the randomized, if you apply A a couple of extra times, then you get the green and the blue lines 
which in this case are basically overlaid by the black line. You don't see them, that the errors are basically indistinguishable in that case. And this is really the where, so I like this example because this is how I got into randomized linear algebra that I was working, we were working on uh, discretizations of integral operators really. So all operators we worked with looked like this and they just worked like magic. Everything, you know, it was much faster and it works just as well as traditional methods. So then of course the question come up, well, maybe these things can be of interest to, uh, to, da to data science and computational statistics and so on where they would be much, they would be even more useful because there, there's a dearth of algorithms that can handle really large data sets. But uh, then the catch is that in all these applications, the singular values typically decay slowly, and then the methods to work far worse. So if you look at the scale on the previous slide, the singular values decayed by like 12 orders of magnitude or something. Here, the scale, you have much slower decay. So you have a little bit of decay initially and then it slows down. And this is much more characteristic of what you see in data applications. And now you see the red line really performs quite poorly that if you want, say, this level of accuracy, then the rank that you would need if you use the SVD is far smaller than what you would need if you use the randomization. So in this case, you really do need some powering. So in applications, this is how these techniques are typically used. You do apply A several times to the Torfin random matrix. And now you may wonder that, well, this is a randomized algorithm, so shouldn't the output be a random variable? I just showed you one answer. And uh, what I showed you was, of course, just one instantiation. I draw one Gaussian random matrix, and then I compute the corresponding errors. So in order to analyze these things, you have to use probability theory. So the error, so the error here is A minus Q, Q star A. This is uh, the, error, the most relevant error metric. And uh, it is a random variable, of course. So here we plot it for a hundred different runs. And uh, the thick line in the middle is the average. So you see in this case with the singular values decay rapidly, it, it's really very benign that all the runs are very tightly concentrated. When you have slow decay, it looks a bit worse. So in this case, you have more variance. You have, it wiggles around more. But when you use powering, you get not only that the expectation is smaller, but you also get less variance. So the powering is really very essential in these cases. So, there's a lot of theoretical work to analyze these things. And uh, you can prove theorems along the following lines. So you can analyze the error. And uh, here it really matters what norms you use. So the most of the things are most naturally analyzed in the Frobenius norm. That's usually where the results fall out the most naturally. And the bound is actually quite gratifying in the Frobenius norm because we have the bound on the, so, here we have uh, the error in the observed output and uh, the theoretically minimal value is what I have on the right hand side here. So this is just the eckhart young theorem. It says that the quantity on the left is bounded by the quantity that I circled on the right. So the factor of suboptimality, this guy is really quite modest in this case. But again, in data applications, Frobenius norm bounds are not very useful because this, it's, you can basically not differentiate between the signal and uh, the noise if you use Frobenius norm. So this is where the spectral norm becomes much more interesting. And the spectral norm bound looks much worse because now the Eckhart Jung says that the ideal right-hand side would have just this quantity that I circled. That's the theoretically minimal value. So I have that guy and it's multiplied by some prefactor, but then I also have to pay for the Frobenius norm bound. And this is really, it's a fundamental property of sampling. So the basic RSVD does have a limitation because of the second term, but by incorporating a few steps of subspace iteration, you can really, you can really fix this problem because that, that helps you separate the larger singular values from the smaller ones. Here are some references. The slides are posted, so I, well, for the most part, just leave these for people to look up in case anybody's curious. 
All right, so that's what I was going to say about the basic randomized singular value decomposition. So next, I wanted to talk about um, interpolatory and CUR factorizations. So this again touches on many of the themes that Petros has already introduced. So let's see. So we're, we're addressing the same type of problem. So we're given a matrix A that could be very large, and I want to compute a low rank approximation to it. So again, think of A as being large, and I want a thin factorization of it. But now what's special is that the rows of R should be some subset of the rows of A. So sometimes we refer to this as you're looking for a natural basis. So your basis for the row space is going to be some of the elements, some of the rows themselves. So I want to pick K of them to compute a row K, uh, rank K approximation to the matrix. And this is one of the problems that Petrus mentioned as being um, very hard. You know, it's combinatorially difficult to compute these things. And uh, why would you want to do it? So there, there are many reasons. So one is that interpretation. So for instance, think, say you're tracking stock prices. So every row corresponds to one stock and every column is the price at some time. Then if you do PCA on a matrix of this type, then uh, the, uh, the output would give you some weighted linear combinations of the stocks. Whereas it might be more interesting to get handles on some specific stocks that uh, might be of interest. Another one is computational efficiency. Oftentimes it's, it's much cheaper. You can lower asymptotic complexities. And uh, in particular in PD applications, this turns out to be very, very powerful. Uh, factorization of this type, it preserves things like sparsity and non-negativity. So if A is sparse, then R will be sparse. If A is non-negative, R will be non-negative, and so on. So as I mentioned, finding the absolutely optimal solution here is very difficult. But if you relax it a little bit, it becomes very tractable. So in practice, if you do Gram-Schmidt on the rows, this works very well. It's, there are counterexamples where you can show that this is substantially suboptimal, but in the typical situations, this always works very well. But uh, now the diff the, there's a couple of difficulties. So if A is a matrix of modest size that you in principle could do Gram-Schmidt, then as we're gonna see, the, this is a fairly slow operation because after every step, you have to update the remaining rows. So you pick one and then you update the rest and then you pick the largest remaining one and then you have to update the entire matrix. So it's a communication intensive operation. And if you think of the situation where A is say very, very large and sparse, then clearly it's undoable. You just cannot run Gram-Schmidt on the rows. And randomization provides a very elegant solution to this conundrum. So the randomized approach here, it looks very, very similar to how we did randomized SVD. So again, we have the matrix A, I multiply it by a thin random matrix and I get my sample matrix Y. Okay, so now the claim is that if I do Gram-Schmidt on the rows of Y, which is affordable because it's a small matrix. So if A is of moderate size, then Y is small, so it fits in cache, so you can do this very fast. If A is a very large sparse matrix, then Y is gonna be dense, but it's hopefully gonna fit in RAM, and you can actually do stuff to it. So then you can use any of the well-developed algorithms to find the rows that best span the row space. And the claim now is that if I do this for Y, then sort of almost by magic, the corresponding rows of A will be a good selection for the, uh, for the interpolatory decomposition. And uh, this actually, it's, it's faster than randomized SVD because it only involves one interaction with A. And we can easily accelerate it. So we sort of alluded to this and I hope to get time to return to it later, but you can use these specialized random projections, random embeddings to compute Y very rapidly. So you can reduce the complexity here to MN times log K. So in this uh, description, I've focused on using the rows to span the row space. Of course, you can do the same thing with the columns. So you can have the same type of factorization just flipped. That's what we call a column interpolatory decomposition. 
you can do it on both sides, then you get a double-sided ID. So in this case, you have the submatrix of A in the middle, or you can use a CUR factorization where the submatrices are on the outside. And which one is the best choice? It really depends on the application that the, uh, the double-sided ID is, has, it's a little bit preferable from a point of view of numerical conditioning, but uh, CUR has a, a big advantage in that C and R will be sparse if A is sparse. So it's very data efficient to store A. So notice that in order to store this CUR factorization, really all you need to store are the index vectors that point out which columns of C and which columns of R are the good spanning columns, and then this small link matrix U. So it, it can be a very powerful method. And this also connects to um, the sampling technique. So Petros, um, most of the discussion concerned uh, sampling. So the idea there is that you put some probability distribution on the rows, say, and then you draw K rows from that uh, probability distribution. And this is, it's an extremely powerful technique when A is gigantic or when it's expensive to form the matrix elements. So if you have something like a, a kernel matrix or something, you, you just cannot form all of A and then start using dense methods on it or doing the RSVD, right? So we're running into a problem because I need to execute a dense matrix matrix multiply. You couldn't do that in those situations. So, uh, so those are really two different paradigms. You can do sampling. It's an enabling technology in many situations. And uh, there's really wonderful theory that supports this. Or you can use this dense embedding. So you mix up all the elements of A. So they tend to be a little bit more robust and you get, you get more reliable and more accurate answer, uh, outputs, but, um, but they're not always possible. You can't always do that. Again, I will skip over the references and move on to the next topic. So next let's talk about, let's go beyond low rank factorization. So say you want to compute the full factorization of a matrix. And it at first seems like randomization would not really have a place here, but it has a, uh, it, it's actually very powerful in this case as well. And something I particularly like about this is that it's, we're going to see one of the earliest uses of randomization in linear algebra, which I learned about much later than I care to admit, but uh, it, it's very nice. So let's back up a little bit. Okay, so I want to compute the full factorization of a matrix. And in particular, I want to compute a rank revealing factorization. And in linear algebra, the term rank revealing is often taken to have a very specific meaning uh, about how so you compute the full factorization of the matrix. And then the question is how well, if you take the first K terms in that factorization, how well does that approximate the best rank K approximation to the matrix? And there's gonna be some ratio there of suboptimality. And technically the, how that ratio grows with M and N is usually taken as a definition of what does rank revealing mean. So I don't use the term in that sense. I just use some hand wavy. Well, it's a reasonably good approximation basically, but it, it's, it's something that's useful for whatever numerical purposes you're using. And with this informal definition, you can take your classical factorizations that you learn in uh, numerical linear algebra, uh, we can put them in two columns. So we have unpivoted QR and partially pivoted LU on the left. And then we have column pivoted QR, we have fully pivoted LU and SVD on the right. So the factorizations on the right are, are rank revealing in this relaxed sense. Well, so SVD is optimal and the other ones do a fairly good job in practice. And all of these methods have complexity O of N cubed. So there are well-established techniques for computing all of them. They all have cubic complexity. But the point I wanted to make on this slide is that the prefactors are very different for the methods on the left and for the right. And the reason for that is that the, the rank revealing factorizations, essentially all existing algorithms proceed through a sequence of rank one updates. And uh, they're very hard to, uh, to, to block, to make sure that, they, that you don't have to go through n steps of updating the matrix. And this, it's the, the difference between these, it's a problem that keeps growing. So let me show you a numerical graph. So this is just on my 
desktop, it was a few years ago, at work, I just ran MATLAB and I compared the speed of doing column pivoted QR versus QR. So they both have complexity n cubed. The prefactor is even the same. The scaling factor is identical. The pivoting is a lower order term, but there's a factor of 10 difference in computational speeds. So for a matrix of size 10,000 by 10,000, it's a question of spending 10 seconds versus 100 seconds. So what can you do? And uh, this is my, uh, one of the earliest things that, one of the earliest applications of randomization, which I think is really nice because it was a little bit neglected for a while. So the, the idea is this. So it's exactly the idea that Petros mentioned that if you apply a, uh, a random transform, so think of V here as a random unitary matrix. So you, in principle, you draw it from a Haar transformation. In that case, the theory gets very easy but then you randomize. In this case, I'm talking about the columns, Petrus talked about the rows, but what I call a rand is now a matrix where every column has exactly the same probability distribution. So they have flat leverage scores. So here, I'm not gonna use that for sampling, but you can show that if I take this matrix a rand, so I randomly mix the columns of a, and then I perform a QR factorization, a plain unpivoted QR factorization of a rand, then I get a factorization of this form where U and V are unitary and R is separate triangular. And this factorization is rank revealing in a certain sense. So this is, it's a very powerful idea. And uh, Parker in 95, he not only pointed this out, he also demonstrated a, um, there are ways of doing fast. So there's sort of like trigonometric transforms. There are hierarchical, there are clever constructions for how to approximate something from a random unitary matrix. So you can do this mixing in ways that are much faster than n cubed. So you can compute a rand rapidly, which in 95 was very important because they really did not want to increase the asymptotic flop count. Today it turns out to be more or less irrelevant because flops don't really matter anyway, but, uh, but that's where this came up. And this idea has later been uh, utilized to great effect by demo and uh, uh, many researchers have drawn on this. And there is a trick. So given how cheap flops are on the one hand and the matrix matrix multiply in particular, you can improve a little bit on, the, on Parker's URV factorization, which is if you draw a Gaussian random matrix and then you apply a, a transpose to it a couple of times, and then you do two unpivoted QRs. So this is a very simple algorithm. So it just involves drawing a Gaussian random matrix, doing a couple of matrix matrix multiplies, and then two unpivoted QR factorizations. Then we get this factorization. And this turns out to be really good at revealing the numerical rank. So here are two example matrices. So the axis work the same as on the previous slide. The black lines are the exact singular values. This shows how well you could do in principle in approximating these matrices. And uh, the red lines are column pivoted QR and the blue lines are, um, is the basic randomized algorithm by Parker. And then if you use a little bit of powering, then uh, you basically capture the singular values exactly. Um, here are the computational speeds. So the top line is column pivoted QR, the bottom line, is classical QR, and then you have these randomized URV factorizations in the middle. If you run this on a GPU, then it's really astonishingly fast. Things just fly. So these are the lines. So now you can do basically an SVD of a dense matrix of size 10,000 by 10,000 in about a second. All right, so I am starting to run out of time. Um, so I was next going to talk about how to extend these ideas to column pivoted QR. So let me just give you a very, very high level description of how this works. So uh, in order to compute a, so if you don't want one of these URV factorizations, maybe you really want a column pivoted QR factorization or more importantly, you want a factorization that you could hold. So if you want a partial factorization, then it's important that you can stop once a given tolerance has been met. And you can take this idea that 
that's very easy to understand in the concept of uh, these URV factorizations of Parker and Demo and these guys. And uh, you can work them into the traditional householder QR factorization for factorizing a matrix. And what they do is that the randomization here, it allows you to pick a block of pivot vectors at once. So given the matrix A, you can ask, well, I want 50 pivot vectors without updating the matrix. I want a selection of 50 columns that together form good choices for the first 50 pivot vectors. And this problem is exactly the same as the problem that arises in computing the CUR factorization. You want to find the ones that have the maximal spanning volume, which is really ideal for randomized sampling that uh, when you draw these random vectors, they are likely to have maximal intersection with the set of columns that have maximal spanning volume. So th there's really beautiful connections here and randomization allows you to do this blocked sampling, uh, the blocked pivoting, finding groups of pivot vectors. And uh, here are the speed ups you get. So here we compare the randomized column pivoted QR um, towards uh, I compare that to LAPAC and you get really dramatic speed ups even for moderate size matrices. All right, so let me spend, so Arvind, I have about five Maybe. minutes. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So let me just quickly touch upon some active research areas that are related to the problems I've talked about. So one was this random matrix. So this has come up several times that we often talk about using Gaussians, but you really have a lot of liberty in picking different random matrices here. So you just need some amount of mixing there. And you can do subsampled uh, trigonometric maps. You can do sparse omegas. So, and this, you really have a sort of shocking amount of latitude. And the theory for all these things, so the, this to me is a very interesting problem. So the theory is very weak for almost all of these things. The performance guarantees are much worse than Gaussian. Now you can indeed construct counterexamples, but in practice, in real life, they work beautifully. So you can use a sparse matrix and have just two or three non-zero entries on each row of omega, and it works very well. And uh, you can use a little bit of Gaussian sampling to get a certificate of accuracy so that your output is perfectly reliable. So you can use these super fast methods and still have the confidence of a Gaussian method. Another issue are these uh, single view algorithms. And uh, it seems like Petros was a little um, over these things. I still think they're really cool. And because it, it solves something that I, I'm not sure is solvable using deterministic methods. So the, the problem here, for those of you who may not have seen this, is you're given a matrix A, it's exactly the same framework as we've talked about so far. You want to compute a low rank approximation to it. You're not allowed to store it. You're allowed to see each matrix entry only once, and you cannot specify the order. And randomization solves this in a really beautiful way. So you pick two of these, random embeddings, you keep these on hand, and then as the matrix streams by you, you compute samples from the row and the column space. So you can build these incrementally. So these are the things you hold in storage. So mega are the uh, random maps that you draw, and y's are the samples that you measure. So you have to be able to store these things. And uh, then as A streams by you, you just incrementally add the contributions to Y. And then from this information, you can back out a low rank factorization. And this is a subject of active research. I think these methods are very powerful, but it, it is absolutely true that you do get larger errors. So if you can revisit the matrix, then you absolutely should. There, you should not use these things for matrices that are stored out of core or, just that your matrix matrix multiply is a little slow or something, you do gain a lot by applying the matrix. So definitely do it if you can. Um, one final point about randomized Krylo methods. So I want to, sometimes when you give this talk, you get, I'm very excited about these methods. And uh, I want to say, show that there are strong bridges to more traditional techniques. So if you, we think about this problem, given a matrix A, you want to find a k-dimensional subspace that captures its range, then the randomized method really corresponds to doing this. You draw k 
random vectors, and then that's your approximation to the range. In a traditional Krylov method, you draw one vector omega and you apply A repeatedly to it. So the number of matrix vector multipliers is the same between these two. And of the two, the Krylov method will be far more accurate, but it's typically slower because it's more data intensive. It requires more communication, but it's very powerful, in particular where the singular values decay rapidly, or if you want other outlying eigenvalues if for a square matrix or something. Um, Krylov methods, of course, have lots to say in their favor. And the only point I wanted to make here is that there is, of course, a rich design space between these two. You have, don't have to go to extremes. That if you take a block Krylov method, you start with a block random matrix. There's really wonderful methods that can be had. And the analysis here is still relatively early on. We don't fully understand these things. And there's much more parameters to pick. And I think there's wonderful work to be done in this direction. And that, I'll skip this. Just put up the slide of the key points. I don't think I need to go over them because they're all things I already mentioned. So I will be ha very happy to take questions if there are any. Thanks, Gunnar. I hate to be the bad guy and stop this talk, but- uh, No, no, of course. We'll have, we'll have the opportunity to, uh, first of all, let me say we'll have the opportunity to discuss more about this because these points will come up during the working group. But anyway, I wanted to thank you for your presentation. I already see Hand is up, Tammy, I'll just get to you in a second. Uh, if there are more questions, please raise your hand. Uh, Tammy, why don't you go ahead? Sure, yeah, thanks. These were two really interesting talks. And uh, so thank you for that. I wanted to ask maybe for some commentary. Um, can you comment on why randomized numerical linear algebra methods are not used more often? I, I have my own ideas and I think Petros hinted at one answer, which is that it's not trivial to port these methods to each new scenario. Um, and sometimes the theory needs to be extended a bit to make that happen. But I, I wanted to hear maybe from both of you about your thoughts on that. I, so my thought would be that they, so first of all, I would say that they are used for in a lot of big data applications because they were an enabling technology. That the, for really large matrices, I don't know what else you would do. So for, you know, large kernel learning problems. And, yeah, no, but it's definitely true. Right. So then for the problems where you can do both, it, the bar is really high, right? So they, in order to convince users, they have deterministic methods that work very well. They're happy with them. You really have to offer them something that A is, it's much better than the existing things. And also you can't have free parameters and so on. And this is why in particular, I think these, hybrid methods with cradle methods. I think that's a very powerful set of techniques for PD solvers and so on, but it, we just have too many parameters. So for instance, the column pivoted QR, I think is gonna be widely used because there are almost no free parameters. You, you can can that up and present it as a very easily usable piece of software. Yeah, definitely. Um, Agnieszka, go ahead, please ask your question. Uh, so thank you for a wonderful talk. I have a question related to, are there any attempts on using this rand randomized techniques in the context of nonlinear problems? Because uh, in a sense, linear systems are the, the first uh, guinea pig that we pick when we, uh, we solve uh, you know, linear algebra problems, but what about in particular, the next step is naturally eigenvalue problems, but then in general, nonlinear problems. So can any of you, either Petrus or uh, Gunnar, you can comment on, on that direction? Right, so, so the term nonlinear non problems is very large, right? So mm -hmm. if you talk about things like finding nearest neighbors or, you know, there are all sorts of problems in data science or, you know, partitioning graphs and all this stuff where randomization is a standard tool that it's, it's been used for a long time. The community is perfectly comfortable and happy with this. Um, as you get closer to linear algebra, then, you know, there are the, a lot of interest in nonlinear eigenvalue problems and so on. And I have not seen much work beyond the obvious things of, you know, you linearize and then you have some iteration or something but uh, more sort of profoundly nonlinear matrix problems, 
I mean, so, so there is a lot of work on things like non-negative matrix factorizations or sparse approximations. Like these things have been looked at extensively. So yes, I, I think the answer is yes, but I, I will not attempt to give a 60 second survey of the most important <laughs> results in that area. Perhaps Petros can fill in. I mean, um, I, I, the, the example that comes to my mind is actually non-negative matrix factorization, uh, where even though some of these techniques have been used, we actually lack a lot of results there to begin with, even with deterministic techniques. We don't know what converges unless you make assumptions about the inputs and so on and so forth. Um, think of even a, a logistic regression, right, which is solved through iterative reweighted least squares problems. Even that procedure, we do not understand well how the error propagates from one iteration to the next if you do run, if you use randomized uh, uh, linear solvers at every step. I, I think there is a lot to be done there. I, I think we are still learning about the linear stuff and I think both Gunnar Stock and mine highlighted this. So non-linear, you know, I, there is something, but we, we, can, we can talk about this in the group. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Eric had his raised hand raised up. Um, maybe not anymore. Yeah, no, no, I did. Oh, maybe yeah. I un unraised my hand. Sorry. Maybe we'll we'll end the session with your your question. <laughs> it was it was supposed to be raised. Um, so actually, uh, well, it wasn't meant to follow up on the previous question, but like, we've been using randomization in in nonlinear problems, but of course, they're mostly for the linear pieces in those algorithms. And and Petros had had uh, you know his his uh, uh, was it interior point method, of course, is is another. Kind of then a link. So one thing I find interesting, I don't not saying this should be kind of distinguished, but um, for some of the things we've done, you can think of this as using randomization in, in these algorithms, but you can also think of them as stochastic optimization methods, which is often treated as a completely different kind of class, but they seem to be strongly linked to me. So um, yeah, I just want to hear if you have any opinions on Oh, that. yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, yes, so th there's a strong link between uh, linear algebra and optimization. And I think randomization, there the jumps where Rachel Ward has really highlighted the, the connections to, to optimization and ideas there. and provided a very nice uh, hybrid, a synopsis of, of the two areas. And there's also work by uh, Goran Riktarik that I find very compelling in that direction that combines ideas from these randomized embeddings with optimization techniques to solve, you know, you want to compute the inverse of a matrix, so you want to solve a linear problem, uh, some linear regression problem, sometimes with side constraints and so on. And uh, it, it's an unbelievably large and rich area, and yes. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, this, this was a wonderful session and generated a lot of discussions and actually set the stage beautifully up for the working group formation. Uh, so I propose that we take um, what is now a 13 minute break. We'll reconvene at 2.45. Uh, I'll go over what a working group means and we can talk about some ideas for it. So stick around um, and thank you. Thanks to both the speakers. We had a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>